warm welcome to panel discussion. Suddenly turning the ball. National Gallery Singapore, Cultural Center of the Philippines, um, Vika Estrada and myself, um, Eugene, would like to welcome everyone to this conversation organized in conjunction with the closing of the exhibition, Suddenly Turning Visible, Art and Architecture in Southeast Asia, 1969 to 1989. We are delighted to be able to have this talk, which was actually part of a symposium we wanted to organize at the Cultural Center of the Philippines in Manila, which was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Before starting this panel discussion, including Rika Estrada, myself, and artist Nani Maestro, I would like to briefly introduce the exhibition titled Suddenly Turning Visible. In 1981, the Filipino artist and curator Raimondo Albano coined the expression suddenly turning visible to describe the rapid transformation of Manila's urban landscape. The visibility that Albano was evoking was an aspirational one. As the Philippines, along with Singapore and Thailand, had embarked upon their most ambitious infrastructural projects yet. The driving force was the logic of developmentalism a desire for rapid economic growth in tandem with the rapid urbanization of Bangkok, Manila, and Singapore into modern metropolises. Art had a critical role to play in the transformation of these cities into modern metropolises. Artists and architects advanced varying perspectives towards this new vision. They freely engaged with international movements such as abstraction and realism, and melded folk and popular traditions rooted across Southeast Asia into their work. The aim was to shock, scare, delight, please, and satisfy the public out of their preconceived notions of art. The exhibition Suddenly Turning Visible examines this paradigm shift by comparatively examining the story of three influential art institutions that emerged almost simultaneously the Cultural Center of the Philippines, the Alpha Gallery, and the Birasri Institute of Modern Art. This exhibition was realized with the generous assistance and loans from partners like the Cultural Center of the Philippines, the Bangkok Art and Cultural Center, the Birasri Institute of Modern Art Foundation, and individuals like Datuk Sri Lim Chong Kiet. I will now pass over to uh, my colleague, uh, Rika, and she'll talk about the curatorial or the approach that we'll be taking uh, to this panel discussion. Rika, over to you. Thank you, Jin. Um, so the images uh, of the exhibition, um, like what we see here, reveal a focus on the archival. Um, for today's talk, uh, we hope to use the archive to guide our discussion on the relevance and impact of the Cultural Center of the Philippines um, on the Philippines and uh, on Philippine art history. Um, also, its role as a site for uh, experimental practice in the 1970s and after, um, as seen through the perspective of artist Lani Maestro, who we have here today with us. Um, um, the exhibit, Suddenly Turning Visible, was doubly special to us at the CCP since it coincided with the 50th anniversary celebration, which was a year-long event um, that culminated last September. Um, the five decades of the CCP has shown that while our building structure may be built from concrete, um, what keeps it alive are the artists and the cultural workers that we've worked with um, through all these years. Uh, it's artist creations, their visual artworks, their performances, films, uh, written works that make CCP what it is today. Um, it's also their struggles, their defiances, their breakthroughs, um, and, and triumphs that sustain us um, and allow us to remain relevant. Uh, with this in mind, we're very glad to have uh, Lani Maestro with us today. Um, it was just a few months ago that CCP, um, or that um, we, we came up, like, like Eugene mentioned, that we came up with this um, pivot to this online um, discussion. Um, and, and I'm so happy that we will finally be able to talk together um, about this. So thank you. Um, for just a quick, we will have um, a short greeting, of course, from the president of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, Mr. Arsenio J. Lizazo.
Mr. Seng Yu Jin, Deputy Director of the Curatorial and Research of the National Gallery of Singapore. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant day to everyone. The world, as you all know, has been on lockdown since the first quarter of the year 2020. We learned that other countries whose schools, businesses, and uh, cultural institutions have closed their physical doors to the world, brought about by the pandemic, which unfortunately has crippled the global economy. The artistic and cultural communities in the Philippines are just as badly affected given that most of the region in the country are under general community quarantine. As with other artistic and cultural organizations, the main recourse of the Cultural Center of the Philippines turns to is digital technology in order to provide and enhance virtual cultural spaces online. While numerous digital initiatives are being done to preserve and provide access to cultural heritage objects online, long before the COVID-19 came, the current situation has managed to expand the number of digital initiatives nevertheless. Although the internet has helped artistic institutions, cultural organizations, schools, colleges, and uh, universities, commercial establishments, government agencies, salary workers, students, or practically anyone with Wi-Fi access. The lockdown still has a strong impact in limiting the need for personal and public connections. Given the opportunity to reconnect with the world through online platform, the Cultural Center of the Philippines and the National Gallery Singapore are co-presenting a roundtable discussion to supplement the educational capacity of the exhibit. Suddenly turning visible, art and architecture in Southeast Asia, 1969 to 1989, where five artworks from the CCP Visual Arts Collection are now on display at the National Gallery in Singapore. This online discussion will examine the legacies and impact of the CCP and its role as a site for experimental practice in the 1970s and after. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lizazo, for that warm welcome. Um, and now, of course, without further ado, we'd like to introduce our, our artist that will be um, learning from today, Ms. Lani Maestro. Lani, um, actually, we, we are very interested for you to share perhaps your um, earlier me earliest memories of the Cultural Center of the Philippines. And uh, could you also say um, what the arts you know, community, um, including yourselves, you know, thought of the institution? Uh, was there also such a thing as an art community? And uh, was the CCP really a place for them to gather and interact? Hi. Hi, Eugene. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it, it's uh, going back in time. It's almost 40 or so years ago. So I hope I can uh, give you a, a, a very uh, a, a vivid description of that time. It's probably one of the most memorable time of my life, my uh, memorable artistic time. Uh, so I was uh, I was going to university in the, in the seventies, and then uh, I had some courses with the. Uh, the late artist Roberto Chabet, and 
in a way, he was the first connection that I had with the cultural center because he used to be the previous director uh, of um, uh, the visual arts. And then he started teaching at the university and then he was succeeded by Ray Albano. But, you know, they, their collaborations continued even at that time. And so I'll, I think um, later, um, there were a lot of artists uh, who were, well, a lot of us who were still students at that time, we showing at the cultural center, uh, mainly because of the invitation of uh, Roberto Chabet. So I would say, yeah, my, um, uh, my first meeting or encounter with the CCP was, I guess I was still a teenager then, I was in, uh, uh, you know, uh, 16, 17, 18. Uh, anyway, and I, I always cherish this experience because it was like an extension of, of art school. So uh, we began showing there, you know, with exhibitions organized by Roberto Chabet. And then through that, you know, I met uh, Ray Albano, who was running the CCP at that time. And it was such a wonderful time of, uh, I guess, generosity. I felt so welcome to be in that environment. And somehow, Ray, I guess, with the staff and everybody else that worked at the Cultural Center, it, it felt um, there was so much inclusiveness in that environment. So for me, as a young, shy, <laughs> you know, student artist at that time, it, yeah, it was a, a very welcoming environment for us to share uh, or to learn from other artists' works. And as, as I was saying before, uh, Turika, uh, you know, it was, uh, there was no hierarchy. There was no sense of authority, authority with, all the people who were working there. We were young artists, or I was, but at the same time, we were all treated with, uh, um, with equal, how do you say, uh, attention. And so I guess if I, if I say community, it wasn't, nothing was established or organized, but somehow everything happened organically. And so when I say it was such a, it was an extension of, of school, of some kind of uh, learning institution. It was more because we were all learning from each other, but the actual experience. So every time an artist had an exhibition, uh, we were all excited. And because Ray was always open in terms of sharing that, oh, you know, so-and-so is going to have an exhibition next week. Go, oh, okay, you know. So in a way, it was such a, I guess a very open school kind of environment where everything was allowed. And so the space for experimentation was so uh, rich and uh, yeah, so encouraging. But, you know, theoretically speaking, there was no, uh, I guess I'm saying this because I, then I left for abroad and, you know, it was introduced to this idea of uh, critical thinking and theory. But that time, all of this happened by osmosis. <laughs> all of it happened by uh, it's like organic, organic learning and thinking. And so, and of course, there was no so-called art market at that time. So the environment was so free. Uh, so in a way, you know, like now I don't have enough uh, images to show my work from that time because. I don't think any of us documented our work. <laughs> there was no such thing as thinking about, you know, adding an exhibition <laughs> to your CV or uh, documenting your work to show. It was just to be in the moment. So I think it was a special time in terms of art making where there was so much freedom and just the passion for making art itself. And that was the environment. Lani, it's interesting you mentioned words like, you know, freedom, you know, open yeah. and, and also inclusive, yeah. which I, um, I'm sure was very much um, the environment that um, the CCP afforded to, to younger artists uh, yeah. as opportunities yeah. to, to have yeah. exhibitions. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there were also artists who were excluded uh, from the CCP, yes. from showing at the CCP. I mean, I'm thinking yeah. about, you know, collectives like Kaisa Han, 
you know, for example, the social realists. I was wondering if you could share some of your thoughts um, yeah. about this inclus inclusive exclusiveness that was happening at the CCP. Yeah. Maybe we can look well, at the previous slide as well while we're discussing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I showed this, this slide on the left. It was a, it's a graffiti from the University of the Philippines, you know, where at that time that was just to, to give you a, a feeling of, of that uh, climate, you know, uh, that I was, uh, that I found myself in. And the, the banner on the right, uh, that image on the right, uh, was that by Kaisan? Because Kaisan actually happened short uh, uh, from my memory after. So, um, yeah, I think uh, as I was telling Rika yesterday, it was very interesting because I, there was that part of me that was, you know, very enthusiastic, uh, artistically learning at the CCP, but at the same time, I had this other life, which was my political life in the underground movement. I say underground because everything during martial law was underground, right? So any kind of political resistance or activity was illegal. So I say underground. Uh, if these people were excluded, I'm not really sure, because as I was saying yesterday, um, somehow there was a kind of oppositional thinking in terms of political art or politicized art and everybody who exhibited at the CCP, we were called artists who were doing high art. <laughs> so I think there was a kind of uh, oppositional thinking that was happening at that time and partly because, um, not because we were not, uh, it, it, equipped theoretically or art historically to define this, this, this tendencies or these movements. But uh, somehow, you know, that time, it seemed inevitable to make things, this, uh, this, this disparity somehow uh, just oppositional. Uh, but for me, uh, I, I just felt free, you know, being in the environment at CCP artistically and that I did not feel, uh, I guess, being involved in the underground or in the political movement. I was friends with all of the social realists and, you know, I also work with them, but somehow deep inside, personally, I felt it wasn't my language. And so I couldn't actually, uh, we were doing political work which was non uh, artistic, it's not artistic work uh, in terms of organizing and other things, but somehow the artistic side of me uh, needed to flourish. And I didn't really understand what that was. So I felt this dilemma, you know, in a way, maybe it was paradoxical. And there were some social realists who criticized me for, you know, walking these two, two sides where uh, maybe, you know, I don't know if some some of them thought I was betraying the cause or whatever because I was showing and working at the CCP. It troubled me a little bit, but at the same time, I think it was the same dilemma that pushed me to really uh, strive for this reflection or uh, about art itself or art practice itself. What is it? What does it take? Or what is the so-called right form uh, to do to address, you know, to address the political or social climate of that time. So for me, it was, I had to be true to myself to be able to find a language that would express all of those sentiments that I have in a form that I felt was truthful. So I think deep inside, I had this quest uh, or to formulate uh, a language that was true uh, artistically and not just go to or start doing figurative, uh, realistic artworks that were more acceptable at that time as social realism, because I guess there was also this idea of work that was understood, you know? And I guess maybe it functioned for the urgency of that time, which was to uh, show resistance. But I felt that uh, I stayed in the environment or I was nurtured by the environment at CCP because 
uh, I will, you know, borrow this term from the Brazilians uh, uh, who who also did resistance after, uh, you know, uh, I guess post-war artists in in Brazil, where they uh, they called the movement called uh, where they way where they formulated this phrase uh, the experimental um, exercise this very experimental exercise of freedom and that was what I felt CCP was you know it was maybe there were other people like me who had secret lives of being involved in the movement but at the same time we didn't share that with other artists in the CCP like nobody in the CCP I think knew I was an activist so but it was okay but I felt that uh somehow there was this other institution that allowed an environment for this experimental exercise of freedom. You know, I don't think people in the left saw that as that. They just thought, oh, this bourgeois high art, you know. But now I can see it was something else. You want to talk a bit um, about the influence of Jose Maceda? Like, we, we can see here ah. the... 100 cassette, a poster of cassettes 100, which is also part oh, yeah. of the suddenly turn visible, uh, turning visible exhibition. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think Jose Maceda was my first artistic influence, if I could call it that. Uh, I mean, that was before I was still a teenager. That was before I went to art school and university. I saw an ad in the newspaper that called for, I think it was for not Udlut, Udlut, Udnayan maybe, mm-hmm. where, he, yeah, where they had asked people to come to their, to a Sari Sari store, a corner store, and bring their radios and put it in a certain kind of a band or station. And then, you know, uh, so I think, I, I'm not saying this, uh, maybe I'm recalling this, I'm recalling this from my childhood, but maybe it's not all accurate. So. And then the idea that everybody at certain times across the country, you know, would put the sounds together, a uh, certain band. So I thought, what is this? You know, I was 14. I thought, wow. So I think that was the beginning of my interest in conceptual art. Also the idea of imagination, even though it maybe it didn't happen, but just the idea of all these people around the Philippines at certain times, gathering together with this ra- little transistor radios and putting the band together. I mean, I was really fascinated. And so when I went to art school, uh, I was in my first year, there was an occasion where Roberto Chabet uh, introduced us to the work of Jose Maceda, I think also personally introduced us. And, and that was it. And then, uh, you know, unconsciously, I didn't, really think about it, you know, as uh, pursuing something or studying his work or following his work. They eventually, when I left uh, the Philippines, I was introduced to other works that had the same kind of maybe consciousness or approach. And later on, I worked with John Cage, which was very akin to, uh, to Jose, Maceda, Jose Maceda's thinking. And then, you know, and the rest is history, I guess. And then later on in my life, uh, up until now, you know, I just continue to to research and learn more about Maceda's practice and his works, because I found that more than anyone else, maybe Chabet, I don't know, in the Philippines, he was able to fuse you know, because he also studied abroad and then came back and then started working or doing research with ethnic uh, musical uh, indigenous music in the Philippines and how to, you know, to bring all those things together uh, with his Western classical orientation or education. And I think for me, you know, I was questioning the idea of uh, how people called Maceda as this avant-garde artist, when in fact, he was just going back to the roots, bringing back, bringing back all this culture or music uh, that we always had, 
that we're all rooted in, but because we were so colonized, we we forgot about uh, being this, you know, this kind of archipelago, this country that had all these different or diverse uh, cultures. And I think, I think later on, because I thought, well, I was so influenced by John Cage, Cage's philosophy about, uh, you know, this openness to, um, to culture, to art. And so I thought there must be something else in the Philippines, you know, or in Asia that I could look look into. I forgot, yes, Maseda, you know. And though, so the more, and I think I started, you know, doing research in later on, like maybe five, six years ago, I started reading up on, uh, you know, critical writings on him in this work. And I just felt, well, this is it. He, he already was able to gel, or for me, uh, formalize this problem that I had early, early on, which was how to, yeah, the question of what is Philippine art? Is there such a thing? Or what makes this art, uh, you know, part of a so-called national culture? And I think his, his ethnomusicology, his work, and his philosophy, really, I felt it, it's all there, you know, the idea of uh, fusing, uh, well, how to come to terms with a colonized education or a colonized uh, kind of thinking. So the pros, and then going back to CCP, I think in a way we were doing that, you know, and maybe that was the beginning. Uh, and that's why, you know, when I saw the exhibitions suddenly turning visible, <laughs> I was so excited because I just, suddenly it kind of, uh, came into fruition and then outside of the Philippines similar things were happening I guess because I'm at this age I've had this 40 years of experience I feel like I'm able to see this now like but of course you cannot see that during that time you know there's no shortcut to seeing this kind of uh, larger view of that his art historical event but it was very inspiring for me because I just felt oh, you know, aha, you know, it's like, finally, there's no, it's like, no excuses, no right or wrong. It's just everything had to happen the way it had. So even the oppositional thinking that happened before between uh, high art and social realism in terms of how to deal with social political issues in the environment, you know, for me, they're not oppositional anymore. They just had to happen at the same time. And that, yeah, it's, uh, I guess, through all these years, my artwork or my practice has actually defined or shown me that, that, uh, you know, we just have to acknowledge all of these strains or paths as differences. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, you know, uh, Lani. Actually, um, uh, it, it was also, you know, I, I think the CCP was really also important in, in a sense that when we compare it to um, the Rasri Institute of Modern Art as well as in Bangkok and the Alpha Gallery in Singapore, yeah. we realized what connected um, all three institutions yeah. Uh, yeah. was uh, this idea of, you know, being free and open um, to experimentation, um, the question of, you know, how do we work with, you know, our indigenous, you know, cultures um, and how yeah. do we reshape it, you know, in terms of, you know, um, forging, uh, you know, kind of diverse uh, cultural identities uh, in a kind yeah. of post-colonial, in a post-colonial uh, context. Um, one other yeah. thing that also came up was, you know, how all three institutions offered um, or afforded um, women artists Know, opportunities for their, you know, most in, in many cases, their first solo exhibitions. Um, and, and we thought yeah. we, if you could share with us, you know, um, your experience or, and also the challenges. The yeah, with the, the CCP, CCP. At the CCP. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that time, you know, when I say it was so open, it was, uh, yeah, the question of gender wasn't even an issue. It was like, 
we were just there. So it wasn't like women's art or we didn't even call it that, you know, that was more uh, pervasive when I left the country, you know, and studied abroad. And I thought, oh, you know, there, there's so much focus on this. But my time at the CCP, I don't know, there was no, there was no such thing. So with people like Ray Albano and uh, Roberto Chabet, it never became an issue for me anyway. And so there were a lot of women uh, were during my time. And so we would have these women exhibitions or, well, it was called Five Women Artists or, I don't now know we have how the that, here. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that one, yeah. So, and I think, uh, I wasn't even conscious of it. I wasn't thinking of my gender. I just made my work. But now when I look at, or later when I left, when I looked at the paintings that I did, I realized, I guess the, uh, I guess because I had, I, when I left, I, you know, one of, I, I studied feminist critique of art and culture. And so it became more, yeah, it, it became, it became clearer what I was doing. And this was, and in fact, you know, it seemed like, uh, you know, it, I, I'm just refuting the thing that, <laughs> that I just said a, a moment ago. I didn't realize this was happening, you know, even with social realism, because most of the artists who were social realists, they were all guys, we were all friends, but somehow I just didn't feel like I, I don't know, Maybe, I, I'm not really sure now, maybe it was such a male kind of uh, construction, you know, of, of representation. Um, and so when I talk about my paintings or uh, the paintings that I showed uh, uh, later at the CCP, uh, should we show that? Uh, we can when, we can go to that slide. Um, you want to talk about um, you you mentioned Chabet, uh, Roberto Chabet, but you want to talk about Ray Albano. I think we have them in our next slide. Yeah. Ah, artist designer. Um, we're looking at some photos from the posterity exhibition that we had at the CCP to celebrate our fifty years. On the left. You have a poster made by Roberto Chabet, and on the right, you have a poster by uh, made by Raimundo Albano, among many others. Um, so, we would you want to talk about um, what that was like working with the two of them, working yeah, well, with Roberto Chabet and Raimundo Albano in, in different capacities? Yeah. yeah. Well, first, you know, I've never seen this before. Artist designer, designer as artist. Artist as designer. Yeah, I, I was actually trained to be a designer, uh, editorial designer. And so, you know, uh, taking courses with Chabet changed that course <laughs> of my, I guess, practice. Uh, and the, the, one of the things that really uh, excited me working at the CCP was the wonderful posters that they designed. They were so beautiful, even now, you know, if I look back. They were so well thought of. That was before computers, you know. And and the other thing, I guess, uh, with the two of them, with Ray Albano and uh, Chabet, was that they they never designated uh, any kind of uh, definition of what an artist is. So, you know, artist design was very much intrinsic in the practice, and uh, with with Ray, he introduced me to people at the CCP uh, who were working in the set design, you know, like Dindo Angeles. And, uh, and he would bring us to watch the theater productions. And so it was a very well-rounded kind of uh, practice or environment for art. And Chabet as well, you know, he introduced me to Maceda. So with these people, they were really ahead of their time. They weren't stuck to this uh, art plastique idea of, you know, disciplines, as sculpture, uh, painting, uh, or installation didn't exist then. But somehow, these guys were already ahead of their time. You know, they were doing performative works, uh, as Ray did with Judy uh, Sibayan. And of course, uh, Chabet's interest in architecture and how that kind of uh, 
figured in his work, which now we can see they look, you could be called installation works as well. So already, I think there was so, yeah, the, there was so much, uh, they were really ahead of their time in that sense where before these categories were defined, you know, as we know them uh, art historically from Western uh, movements or models. And, and this was, and I guess that's, you know, that, that term experimental exercise of the experimental exercise of, free, in, of freedom was really appropriate because it wasn't just, yeah, if you think of these people as individuals, they were all really interesting uh, in that sense. And for me, I guess if I think of my first influences as an artist, they weren't really artworks, they were more people. <laughs> I was influenced by the way people were, as people, as beings, as, uh, uh, as thinkers, you know, uh, because they, there's so much kindness about them, there's so much generosity. And I think it was the art or the practice that made them that way, that kind of uh, philosophically, you know, a rounded sense of uh, well-being that made them the way they were and acted the way they were in terms of how they created an environment that was open and free and so much about sharing. And, you know, it wasn't like based on some kind of theory or idea. It was more like a desire to do things together. It felt like a playground, the CCP, you know? Mm -hmm a wonderful playground where we were allowed uh, this feeling of, you know, like children, this is the feeling of wonder. And I think, especially now, these are the kind of things that most people, uh, you know, in the art world miss or lose. The kind of wonder, curiosity, innocence uh, that comes from, yeah, not being jaded by an art market or capitalist kind of <laughs> drives. <laughs> Maybe that's a good segue into the 13 artists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I felt really lucky to, because all of my shows actually happened in the, before I left, happened at the cultural center. So uh, I was just there, I guess, at the right time, or I don't know, you know. Uh, so you and, had, you were part of the 1978 13 Artists um, exhibition. We have the poster. Yeah, there were only six. You, you, what was that like for you, um, being included in that, um, in that roster, I guess? I guess now, you know, it, it seems to be like a big deal, right? <laughs> but that time, I didn't even know what that was, you know? It's like, okay, <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. Well, I, I don't mean that in a, an arrogant way. It was just a show and I thought, oh, okay. Uh, but now looking back, I guess, you know, I don't know. I just felt like I had a lot of, it was like this chance somehow I was just, there and uh, I was you know talking to you yesterday about again like the the exhibition itself it was a very memorable exhibition I was telling Rika about uh, I had only two works uh, two untitled works and then they were hard edge paintings uh, should I describe them you know uh, one these involve, uh, I think, 12 white canvases, and I just painted the sides. So uh, it was a series of uh, uh, diagonal white. So when you come to it, it's like this white painting, but when you move around it, you'll see that there were marks on the side. So I guess in a way, it was a beginning of thinking sculpturally. And then they, uh, I had, another six uh, series of painting paintings that were, I didn't call them an installation, they were just six panels of uh, 
different colored paintings. And so just to describe the environment at that time, we went for a break, coffee break, and then the assistants uh, decided to just put my work up, you know, without me, uh, because they just felt like it. <laughs> so when I came back to the space, I was amazed because they had actually put the paintings up close to the ceiling, you know, normally they would put it in the center of the wall. And I thought, oh my God, how wonderful, you know. <laughs> and they said, is it okay? Is it okay? <laughs> Sorry, we, we just felt like doing it. I thought, sure, you know, but somehow I, I think that best describes that time, for me anyway, that experience of CCP where, you know, uh, you just welcome everything that comes up. And somehow the people who were working there who were non-artists or, you know, assisting us, they were just absorbing all these artistic inclinations, I guess. And they decided, oh, you know, because the environment was so free that they felt it's okay to put it up. So for me, that was one of the legacies of the CCP, this kind of really the, the feeling of sharing, the generosity of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, I guess how people work together manifested in those kind of uh, experiences and sure you know so I said okay let's keep it that way and so for me that was the beginning of I didn't know you know uh, I guess a kind of collaborative practice which I carried on until now I think where you know I always welcome the input of my assistants or carpenters or whoever works with me as, uh, as making work of the moment or in the moment. So it kind of breaks the whatever preconceived ideas I have of what I want things to be, but rather it's just making the work alive and present. Yeah, so that was the, the CCP, uh, the 13 hours artist story I have. And then sidewalks yeah. came. Yeah, connected to, to the 13 artists, actually, of course, you know, we have um, Juni uh, as yeah. well, you know, who, who really kind of came up with this idea of um, Los Bano sidewalks yeah. in yeah. 1981. Um, and yeah, so we are, we are very curious, you know, if you could share with us your experience uh, being one of the artists, you know, in this, in this exhibition. And here we have yeah. actually a drawing by Juni himself um, as he drew this yeah. from memory. Uh, yeah. and, and you can even locate your work uh, here um, <laughs> in this drawing. Uh, and, and yeah, so please um, share with us you know, your, your, your thoughts and your memories of um, being part of this yeah. important exhibition. Yeah, well, you know, I was in awe of Juni's work. Uh, and when I talk about the CCP and this environment of learning from other people's work, Juni was one of the people that, you know, whose work I was like, <gasps> oh my God, this is possible, you know, like to make art like this. When I first saw his wood things, I thought, oh, you know, it was like uh, seeing Art Povera for the first time, you know, or like it's possible to make art from these materials. And that was what Ray brought in, you know, to the CCP, I think. So, and then I met Jun Yi and we were like, yeah, it was, you know, even now I think of it as such a wonderful feeling. It's too bad Juni is not here <laughs> to say that. I, he, he could probably hear it later. But yeah, I was just like, oh, you know, so what? I was just so nourished by this, uh, you know, seeing this kind of work. And so later when he invited me, I thought, wow, really? So uh, I said, okay, you know, I... At that time, I wasn't really working with <coughs> any materials uh, outside of, you know, uh, paper and uh, painting and whatever. And so, yeah, he brought us to Los Baños. And, uh, and in fact, it's like, uh, this was how it went. We arrived in Los Baños. It's uh, outside of Manila. And so it's an environment. Uh, it's UP, University of the Philippines in Los Baños. So very much in nature, wooded, you know, with a lot of trees and vegetation. So he just said, 
okay, this is your place and this is your place. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. And I didn't really have any clue, like, okay, what to do? And I had this other artist, Julie, Julie Luc Delena, beside me. I think she got some kind of gourd and started stapling it. <laughs> I thought, okay. <laughs> you know, it was like, and somehow it was like, oh, just whatever, you just do, you know. I thought, okay. So I guess I just sat there and took everything that was in front of me. So these pieces of twigs, you know, uh, that had fallen from the tree. And then I, uh, yeah, that piece in the middle, what did I have? I had nothing in my purse. So uh, I think I had glue or something. And so I started gathering this leaves that were being fossilized and started putting them together or maybe I had sewn them I can't remember so this was right on the spot so when you I don't know if we have a detail of it do we uh I know we just have we the go back. yeah okay we can go back uh so yeah so I uh I just put them together so in a way they were like my paintings it was like a lot of layering seeing through what was beyond and uh yeah and that was what i did <laughs> and, and Lani, you know, you know and, uh, um, yeah yeah i'm sorry what, what was your experience kind of making a work that was responding to the site itself uh, well, uh which is the open know, space yeah you know what what it was and still to this day you know it's, it's something that i remember it's like, what is it to empty your mind? What is it to stop thinking about anything? But so in a way, that kind of process of working was about being present. So, you know, because there's nothing, there's nothing else. You just have to deal with what's there. And I think, you know, that kind of uh, process or feeling is, is very much it's more a philosophical thing even now you know <laughs> like especially now with covid it's like okay just deal with what you have at the moment because there's nothing else you can do you you just have to make do with what is in front of you despite all the limitations i mean they weren't limitations for site works it was just yeah, so it was like uh, to to get out of something that I was used to, and then to deal with uh, to see the possibilities or properties of of the materials that were right in front of me. Yeah, yeah so that was yeah, and and I think the other people too, you know, uh, the other works that were done, uh, they're very simple. But at the same time, it's like being a child, you know, child play, a child's playground where it's like, okay, make a sandbox or make a sun. So we were putting these things from what we gathered nearby in the forest or just around. And Can so the next slide with some of yeah. the other artists. Yeah. Yeah. So this were this was the this for the audience. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was just, I don't know what to say. It was just that because you were, we weren't showing, we were just making. So the idea of uh, the audience, the work, the artists, the materials, it was all, they all had equal weight. There was no spectacle. It's just how to be, I guess it was a way of showing bringing back or to the work itself what the place was i guess if i think if i if i look at it now it's like how do you bring the place that site to the work and then the work in the site so it became this reciprocal conversation or relationship where again you know for me it was very much uh, in conjunction with the environment 
the, the CCP, you know, where, okay, there's, there's these two, th two things together. All of it was always res in reciprocity. And so, you know, and the work won't exist without the people, this public the audience. And so I think those were important things then. Yeah. <laughs> and on the sense? same, on the same, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if Eugene wants to add anything, but on the same year, um, you had your first solo exhibition, which was yeah. in CCP. Yeah. yeah. I guess at that time, I was still thinking of myself as a painter of some kind. So, but here, I started doing. I used materials as paper, pencil, and colored pencils. You know, watercolor in the hierarchy of uh, plastic art is like, it doesn't have much value as oil paintings or... So at that time, I didn't even realize or notice that. I thought, going back to your question before, Eugene, about women's work, I guess I was defining that in relation to women's work, that okay, using humble materials or very, uh, you know, in the hierarchy of things like less valued materials or processes like watercolors. Uh, when I was doing this painting, I was drawing on, uh, on the floor or on the wall, making, so already there was something very environmental or sculptural about these works where, uh, always getting uh, okay, imprints from my environments. And that was how I was, I actually called them drawings, not paintings. But so I was doing that and then uh, rubbing them with uh, watercolor pencils. And then I washed them, I laundered them. <laughs> so, you know, it's not evident, but I would take the paper and put them in a uh, bath, you know? So that's how I made these paintings. So they weren't like painting flatly. So you know, in a way, it involved the body where, you know, and I remember my mother would always stay up with me when I made this painting that she would say, oh, put a little more pink on that one or <laughs> this one, <laughs> because I would hang them up, you know, like laundry. And so that was how the process went, you know? And um, so in a way, I guess, you know, you can say that was linked to kind of women's work in that sense. And then later I realized, yeah, you know, and then uh, maybe we can show the, the next, oh, okay, sorry, I can't, no, no, sorry, let's go back uh, because I can't see. I guess the detail on the, on the right, that's another painting from another, uh, show. Uh, and I, just to go back to Eugene's earlier question, yeah, I, uh, I was looking at a lot of indigenous uh, textiles in the Philippines mm. and without really being conscious of it. I guess they came out of my paintings, you know, uh, especially with the grid structure. And, you know, that goes back to the kind of, um, grid and textile like the weft and the warp and I only theorized about that later when I left the country uh, and this you know this will tie back to that discussion with uh, how to fuse political art or social art with abstraction because that was my dilemma at that time you know I felt free doing these paintings but at the same time I felt I also had to be able to speak about the social reality of the times and I think this work um, and my studies of textile and feminist critique uh, critical uh, theory brought me to the later works that I you know that I did in uh, when I left the Philippines. So that's, yeah. So this work, Disappearance, was done in 1982. When I left the Philippines, I, uh, well, I had to leave because of martial law, uh, because of my uh, 
political work. And then uh, I found myself, you know, uh, in different art schools in, uh, in Canada. And uh, I was able to get scholarships for a few years. And so I, this was the first sculpture I ever made, I think. And I was very angry because I, I would receive all this mail, all these letters from the Philippines where people told me about the disappearance of my friends, the torture of my friends and family and all of these kinds of stories. So it was personal, but also, of course, there were a lot of people, uh, thousands of people who were detained uh, during martial law. So I left right in the middle of that. So uh, I guess feeling <laughs> kind of destitute in the middle of, you know, uh, uh, in Canada alone, I began uh, incorporating the materials, these materials into my artwork. You know, I, it was just a, maybe a Duchamp thing where I just used them as ready-mades. But uh, so this one, had a, an envelope inside uh, this box, and there's a stamp of Marcos, the, the president, the dictator at that time. And then there's a uh, letter that talked about torture, I think, coming out of the envelope. You can see it. And then at the back of the on the uh, of the box, uh, I guess it, I wrote something about what disappearance was. And so, yeah. And then, so this became, yeah, my, my idea of, uh, so going back to the idea of community and uh, that we discussed earlier, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I felt I had this dilemma of how to, to put political art and, uh, abstraction together. And so I became part of a, a group called Amnesty International where we were uh, helping the release of political prisoners all over the world and particularly in the Philippines. So I, I was just this one person uh, trying to organize different things. And then I thought, well, why, why don't I just use my art, my work as a way to do this political work? So I devised this one piece called Manila Envelopes that involved a table and two chairs where I had put 12 envelopes called Manila Envelopes uh, on the table. And people were asked, or not asked, uh, people had a choice to open the contents of each envelope. So there's a, uh, I wrote something, maybe I should just read it. Uh, just to be more succinct. Is that okay? Go ahead. So in, I, in 1983, I made Manila Envelopes. It was an installation that opened up an engagement with a viewer. It incorporated a chair and a table laid on, laid on it were a dozen envelopes, each one containing an assemblage of fragments of images, poetry, and documents. The focus on the activity of receiving, we can move to the next slide, the focus on the activity of receiving and opening a letter became the participatory motive of the work. The anticip anticipation and complicity in this action could then be translated to the viewer's perception or participation in the opening of the envelopes. The experience became paradoxical and fraught with invasiveness as one engages in the, an intimate process of unraveling. So it's like opening somebody else's letter. I became more interested in the actuality of this experience and the multiple subjectivities that came into being. This was the beginning of rethinking the politics in art. So like this, uh, so this is when you open the envelope, uh, you, it's like an accordion where you open uh, one, uh, where the stories unfold. And this particular image, it's a, um, it, it's an excerpt from a poem uh, by one of the political prisoners. Lily's like torches in the, uh, 
in the dark season of monsoon or something like that, I can remember, uh, constant in the glimmer of fireflies. And so I would just, I took uh, uh, portions of documents and this is all the things that I received in the mail. And then there's one envelope with an image of a woman that's been tortured. And so for me, it was like trying to share this story to people, uh, but at the same time, in the level of intimacy, because sometimes when you read documents, they just stay as documents. And so I wanted to transform it in a way that was more personal. And so in a way that I was receiving the stories of people, not as a political kind of, because uh, sometimes, you know, uh, when things are received as journalism, it just stays, uh, uh, yeah, as kind of this document as opposed to something that you can act on. We can look at the next slide. And then I included, I guess, some memories of, uh, and this one envelope, uh, you open it, and so it's like a, a writing pad where, you know, how, to, how you begin uh, studying how to, you know, your penmanship. And so I, I wrote Marcus Hitler dictator to that Marcus Hitler puppet dictator. And I guess just speaking about, you know, a colonized history where the education that you, uh, uh, that you get is a, a version, of, just one version of history. And this, this text came from um, a writing on the wall that was, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, that one. So, and in, in, the, in the political movements, there were also acts I felt, I found that were also performative. And uh, later on in, in the West, I realized they were called something, they were called agit, prop, agit propaganda. Uh, and we didn't know that, you know, in the Philippines that time. So when I was involved in the, in the movement, because we were not allowed to gather together as a group uh, of people, but uh, one of the protests that we had devised uh, uh, as activists was this thing called lightning rallies, where we would agree to, to meet together in a spot more than three people, and then shout like in a, you know, in a long kind of, in a road, Marcos Hitler, Dictador Tuta, you know, we would just chant like that. So it was, it's like performance art and you can't be arrested because it was fast, you know, so it was called lightning rallies. So we would have this. And so in, in the underground, in the movement, there were all these things that were devised, like, we would have stickers that we put in buses or whatever. So there were all these artistic, uh, yeah, strategies to uh, to make protest, you know. And and later on, I realized, you know, well, it's interesting how it felt very fluxus, <laughs> or it felt uh, like all these things that were devised in, uh, you know, in other countries uh, as, yeah, as artistic processes. I thought, ah, okay. And I think later on, well, I don't know what the next slide is. Okay, so the works that you saw, Manila envelopes, I, because, uh, when I was in Canada already, people would still ask me, you know, uh, please tell other people what's going on in the Philippines. So I just felt I'm only one person. I don't know how to do this, you know, like I don't have an organization. But I found out that art was a way of doing that. So this one little box, it's called correspondence. Uh, the sign, I made a label on the side said, uh, correspondence, if you want to get involved, write. So all of the envelopes had uh, a name of a political prisoner and an address where they could be written. And so somehow this became the participation or the participatory process of the work continued where the audience would get an envelope 
And I think at that time I didn't realize the value or the effect of this work until later on after a year or so when people in the prison said, it's so nice that we received letters from, you know, all over the world the, the, or outside of the Philippines. And I guess I realized then the, the value of, I guess, humanity, you know, where it was uh, that political work also involved just, uh, for example, for the prisoners, for somebody else to know that they were in prison was enough. Uh, so that, I guess, for me, you know, expanded my idea or my thinking or rethinking of what does political work entail? It wasn't just resistance or protesting, but rather how to bring back the humanity that is being violated into the fore. And I think that was the beginning for me of thinking about embodiment, the idea of embodiment. Lani, you want to talk a bit about um, be exhibiting abroad and, and working as an artist abroad. Um, I think these correspondences and disappearances were made while you were away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. And just right after, you know, because mm -hmm. I was busy working. <laughs> and yeah, I didn't, like I said before I uh, to you yesterday, in fact, yeah, I should mention it, that Manila Envelopes was actually inspired by Roberto Chabet's Ziggurat piece, you know? And so that was my first attempt at postmodern, uh, you know, kind of uh, strategy. <laughs> I thought, I really liked Chabet's work and I thought, how could I do something where I could insert, you know, a political kind of bent to it? And so that was, that was the way it happened. I think he will, I told Chabet about it, you know, and I think it was very okay with him. And so, yeah, this was the beginning of uh, rethinking of, uh, for example, in Manila envelopes, I, I was studying weaving and textile at that time because, uh, so I was learning a lot, uh, you know, about different uh, textile history and processes. So, in Manila envelopes, it involved a lot of stitching and all of these things. So there's a lot of metaphors that that made reference to textile history and women's work. Um, you know, we won't go get into that now. But so that I think for me, the working or the making of the work became a rethinking of the possibilities of yeah, an art form that could embody all of this uh, yeah, these thoughts. Um, I guess I was always thinking of like artworks and how to put it all together, you know, without separating a kind of activist work, but how to integrate it all back in. And uh, so I think for me, theorizing was very important, but theorizing through artworks and the artworks always revealed that what was, you know, important. Yeah, um, Lani, I was also wondering about, you know, uh, we talk about theorizing. Um, you think about that third world moment with the Havana Biennale and, and, and you were so, you know, um, yes. actively involved, you know, in, in it. And, and it was an important, you know, third world moment in which, you know, the third world asserted itself. Um, one could call it also a post-colonial uh, moment uh, or moment yes. of resistance uh, at that time. So perhaps you could share with us, you know, some of your thoughts about the Havana Biennale and your participation in it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, very, very important. It was seminal, you know. Uh, so this was the, sh the work I showed uh, in the Havana Biennale, or this was what they chose. It's called In the Dark Depths. Uh, and it was actually a title of a poem by Jose Maria Sison, founder of the Communist Party. But somehow, you know, I thought, yeah, it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful poem. So I was, uh, again, you know, I, this is akin, very close to the paintings that I was doing earlier. So, but just transforming them over and over again. This is like uh, maybe more than a meter long, five, maybe 10 feet long, this piece uh, by 
four feet, so it was quite large. So basically, you know, it just, uh, it, it looked like scarification. Uh, and so I, I burnt wood and then just rubbed the paper with it. So again, very process oriented kind of work. I would burn the wood outside and use the wood as a pencil. But then now with all my body, with my full body kind of rubbing them. And then I gouged out the text uh, and the number, like it's like counting time in prison. And then uh, on the top, the text is like a, from a document. Uh, it said, first they squeezed his testicles with pliers, then they poured blah, blah, blah. So it was a, yeah, a, a torture kind of story, like what they did to political prisoners. At that time, you know, there were like thousands of political prisoners in the Philippines and some of them were my friends. Um, before I left the Philippines, I was visiting a very good friend uh, who, who was a priest. In fact, uh, he founded a liberation the theology uh, while well, he started this uh, idea of liberation th theology in the Philippines. And he was in prison for 10 years. So in fact, it was just like a homage to him. Uh, so anyway, uh, can we go to the next one, maybe? Next one. Okay, so the Havana Biennale was really important because, uh, you know, uh, it was, they questioned the idea of third world. So the language that was being used at that time, because we have, you know, the Venice Biennale, uh, Documenta, all these big, uh, blockbuster biennales and so but who were represented in them so often people from you know so-called third world were not represented because we didn't have money we didn't have uh, pavilions and stuff so the biennale actually put this into question but also the idea of overdeveloped and underdeveloped countries so the idea of uh, the idea of developing was put into the question. That's why I was thinking about uh, Albano's developmental art. I thought, ah, it's interesting, the idea of this developing, right? So for me, this was very seminal uh, exhibition because they, we, they had uh, critics from the usual, you know, there were a lot of, I remember there was a, a panel discussion with uh, critics like Lucy Lippard, Dora Ashton, uh, Louise Kamnitzer, and someone else. And it was actually published, you know, in Art in America, I think. And they were saying, and it was very revealing because they, they were talking about their own process and they realized what was wrong with it, you know. So here they were judging this work from so-called developing countries. And then they said, but who the hell are we saying this is good art and not good art? And they were talking about, I, I think there was a Vietnamese artist, I can't remember the name. And he had this work of umbrellas or kites or something like that. And so they said, but who are we to say this is not art, you know? And these are critics from the West, right? That we look up to. And so that was the beginning of, for them uh, to reformulate their perception of what is good art and not good art. And who are they to say that this is not uh, work that would uh, merit something? Whereas from where they came from, were, for example, countries uh, a lot from uh, Southeast Asia, you know, valued uh, work that was based on craft, for example. So why won't they count? So for me, it was, and also I, I wasn't there. I was there later because I was in the Biennale twice. But this kind of discussions were really important for me uh, as uh, a way of uh, not just discussing, but refiguring out art history, the idea of Eurocentrism and how we based our understanding of, you know, whatever was art, our art education was very Eurocentric. And also, um, yeah, the reformulation of uh, 
I guess this tenets of art history. And it was nice that the people who were participating were also questioning themselves. And so the Biennale made that. And I remember seeing, you know, the, 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 the fifth Biennale that I was, this was the second, and then I was again in the fifth Biennale. And the works were really outstanding because somehow the, I don't know what it is, the, the richness of materials, the, the you know, uh, I guess that was the difference, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> there was something else culturally that kind of for me resonated. And somehow I met people like, uh, maybe some people would know them. There was an interesting discussion with uh, uh, people like Guy Brett, who wrote a lot about uh, David Medaglia and all these other Latin American uh, historians, uh, some people from England. And there was a French uh, writer who, who wrote about uh, conceptual art in, in Chile uh, I forget her name. Oh God, it will come back. But anyway, it's uh, it was interesting because somehow I figured. I guess it's the same thing happened to me when I saw your exhibitions uh, suddenly seem uh, visible. You know, uh, it became this thing where I don't know. It uh, it jarred my whole kind of. Uh, perception about our art history because suddenly there was this other version that was more empowering and empowered and it was it was re i guess restating it's a kind of positionality where we restated this idea of who is speaking anyway you know so restating the subject like who is speaking this history and through whose point of view so that became so all this discussion of post-coloniality became in the forefront uh, where for me personally, it's really, you know, and yeah. So from that time on, I started studying, you know, I actually studied <laughs> uh, Latin American art history as a result and, and other things. And then I found more parallels or from my experience, but at the same time, more inspiring work, especially with the Brazilians, you know, after the 50s. And uh, anyway, we can talk about it more later. And that was, and for me, that, that became, a, yeah, a really eye-opener uh, in, in terms of reassessing or looking at art, art history in terms of how do I relook at my history again from my own perspective or my own point of view? Oh, the, the critic I forgot was Nelly Richard from, she's a French historian who wrote about uh, conceptual art in Chile. And I think I learned a lot from, from you know, this history because uh, I think the conceptual art in the Philippines, uh, there were reasons for it not to flourish uh, in the way I, I felt it could have politically, you know, with a political uh, uh, direction. Uh, but anyway, it was, yeah, and I thought, my God, it's possible, you know, it's possible. And in fact, it worked, you know, in Chile to, uh, to counter the dictatorship at that time. But anyway, yeah, so that was, that was really important and because you know i i got one of the prizes where they gave me one of the prizes for the biennale i it was the beginning for me of a you know i guess the beginning of an entire uh, kind of recognition for my work uh, and so uh, and could you see uh, you mentioned uh, when we spoke that um it was also a way for you to go back home to the Philippines. Uh, yeah, because I I was given this prize, and so Fidel Castro <laughs> sent me this prize, <laughs> and so I thought, oh, okay, I have money now, so I bought a ticket to go back <laughs> to the Philippines, and I thought you had the show 
Um, and so, especially- yeah, when I, when I came back, I, yeah, I, uh, uh, I was invited to, do, to do a show at the CCT uh, called Suspended Voices. And that time, Corazon Aquino was old. Marcus had left and I thought, oh, okay, now it's okay. But of course, you know, same things continue. So yeah, we have a so photo here of the work in the small gallery and in the poster. And I think we have more photos. Yeah. Would so, you like to tell us of, about those, about the work? Yeah, I, yeah, so this was kind of improvised, you know, the, so I was back and said, oh, maybe you should do a show. And I thought, okay. So, you know, everything was done on the spot. As, and I was still working with the, uh, you know, this organization that, uh, uh, for the disappeared, uh, voluntarily disappeared, involuntary disappearance of people. And so I decided to make the show for them, you know, like where there could be a forum for people to, yeah, to know about the disappearance of uh, activists in the Philippines, because not everybody knew about it. And uh, Part of it was just, uh, you know, I burnt this wood and would put candles. I was just recuperating things from uh, like certain rituals that people did to commemorate all those who were gone. And on the wall, the next slide, the next image. Yeah, I just wrote all these names of um, people who were disappeared, but also people who were imprisoned. And outside in the CCP hallway, of the small gallery, I had uh, images of people who were disappeared. Uh, some of them were friends that I do, uh, and they never resurfaced. So I had flowers, flowers on the floor, which created the scent, uh, and uh, so the the names that were written in silver on this. Uh, and you've on your skin paper, they would flutter with the air conditioning vent that would move them. So, yeah, and a lot of people came, and uh, yeah, the, the interesting thing with this show was that a lot of people, non art people, came. A lot of them were peasants, workers, farmers from uh, outside of Manila because you know they had relatives who were disappeared and at the opening we had this kind of cultural thing uh, people sang these beautiful songs and uh, there was poetry reading by people who were ex-political detainees uh, so you know it was the first time i think where a lot of non-art people uh, were present in the crowd and i was telling Rika yesterday that when they came, they were just in awe that so much money could be put in a building like the cultural center of the Philippines when there was so much poverty in the Philippines. And these people have never set foot in a luxurious place like the cultural center. So I think that was also important in terms of, uh, yeah, you know, questioning like, what was culture that was made here for and who was it for? And what was the audience that was, you know, that's why I think, you know, even though there were no political kind of uh, affiliations with what Ray was doing, it went out to, you know, uh, out to the community. And, but then, you know, uh, that exchange with the community coming in into the center, uh, I don't know. But this time, yeah, it was an interesting kind of um, different audience, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, uh, we, we can see, you know, this was a constant question, whether it was it Chabet or um, Albano, it was constantly asking what was the CCP for? Who was it for? Um, and, and I think, you know, Lani, you put it really, very nicely. It's, it's really that reciprocal or reciprocity uh, of uh, involving the audience um, 
that, that was really important. But um, I just wanted to come back to the point, when, when you came back to the CCP and you had your show, um, um, uh, and, and you know, being so involved you know, in human rights and being an activist, um, uh, what, what was your response and the response of, of the audience you know, to, to, to your um, show when you came back you know, having that show at the CCP? Well, you know, a lot of people who were, I guess, involved politically were very happy that there was a show like this that existed and that, that it was possible. You know, some of them were saying, oh, you're so brave, you're so brave to do that. I go, well, what do I have to lose, you know? Uh, but there were also critical criticisms. And I think, you know, and there was one famous kind of uh, article that came out in the, new, in the local publication that was very critical of, of me and the, maybe the work, you know. And I, I understand, you know, because they, they think it was an exploitation of all these political issues for my own uh, artistic kind of uh, whatever. Uh, well, I guess they have the right to say that, but at the same time, at that time, I couldn't really speak about my involvement or too much, you know, because I could end up in prison. <laughs> I still can, <laughs> but you know, it's like, yeah. And I guess for me also personally, it's a thing that I feel, you know, even now saying this is a bit hesitant and always I, I just do what I do. I don't want to proclaim it too much, you know, as my work. It's just, uh, I can use uh, what I am or what I do as a forum to, to speak of other people's uh, plights, you know, uh, but yeah, but you know, it's always been an ethical question for me. Do I have a right to do this or, you know, and so those questions are important. And I think uh, even though I don't regret doing this works, you know, later on my, and some critics say that, uh, you know, my less politicized works later. But I think they miss the point. The politics just becomes embodied, embedded in the work differently. You know, and, um, and now if I, even if I look back at, for example, Roberto Chabet's later work or some of his works, they were in fact really political, but people didn't look at it that way. Or even Jose Maceda. And I think for me, it's, Maybe that's what I not strive for, but I feel closer to that. It's like how to arrive at this form or language where you don't say political, whatever anymore. It's just then if I really want to arrive at a question of what freedom is, I think that's the freedom where I don't have to say it anymore. It's just the work, it is embodied in the work itself. And me as an artist, I have to honestly, truly make it free in terms of my own freedom as an artist to, to, to do the work that I do. You know, it's like maybe I won't have those intentions that are overtly political or social, but it's all there. And I, I see that very much in Maceda's work, Chabet's work, you know. Um, maybe race work in different way. And I, if there's such a thing, you know, of course, what you see now is just a section or portion of my history. Uh, the work that I've done later, uh, you know, it still has all of these things, but less, more formalized, but still, uh, I guess it is important, you know. Uh, absolutely, uh, you know. Yeah, like yeah, I think I think yeah. this is also a great way for us to to end off our our discussion as as you were talking about a di your dilemma, you know, at the start of our discussions, right, yeah. about the yeah. political and abstraction, uh, and then now yeah. coming in a way in a circle, right, in in, in terms of yeah. how you have brought that yeah. the political into your practice um, it, by finding yeah, but, your own you language. Know, yeah, but it all goes back to that time at CCP. Exactly. Exactly. It it was all free. We were so free, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I still think that like, oh, how to go back there, that freedom. 
And I think if there is such a thing, and I think that's more profound than any of this, you know, I feel that, that freedom to be able to, to make work from, uh, yeah, from who we are uh, as beings, you know, not as Filipino or woman or, but as beings, <laughs> just free in, in the most native way, na most native thinking, most native process that we have. And I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, I still strive for that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think really freedom is at the heart of, you know, all fields of cultural production. Um, and, for and, sure, yeah. yeah, for yeah. Sure. And it's something that we're striving for until today in the Philippines and, and, yeah. and, and a lot of other places. Um, yeah. So yeah. thank you so much, mm. Lani, for sharing um, oh, all yeah. of those <laughs> things with us today. You're very welcome. And yeah, it's, a, it's like a time travel <laughs> for me. And it's good to be able to remember that experience and remember all those people. It was so important. They're still around, some of them. But it's a, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, yeah, for inviting me, but also uh, Eugene and all your co curators um, for putting that show together, suddenly turning visible. Because when I was in Singapore last year, I, I was very, very touched by this exhibition. I mean, personally, you know, I was part of the Singapore Biennale, and it was like, you know, I, I took time off from, from work to see your show. Oh, thank and you. Really, you know, it, I just thought, oh my God, you know, it's part of this. So, you know, even though I wasn't there or, you know, it was like, it just, it was really important in that sense. And I think, uh, I don't really know how to describe it, but it, it was so, I was telling Patrick, I said, I was so happy. You know, I have to thank Russell again for telling me to <laughs> go see it. And uh, yeah, really. And I, I enjoyed, you know, the discussions that you had that I had followed after. And yeah, because it makes so much sense in terms of, I guess, my own, um, how do you say in, in French, you say parkour, uh, my own path or whatever it is the, that I, you know, would like to continue investigating and somehow i just felt oh i'm not alone <laughs> i'm not alone in this and so it was really really nice thank you thank you so thank much you uh Lani. So, yeah. so rita and myself really would we would also like to thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, for all these precious um memories and also your thoughts and very critical um you know kind of a perspective uh, as well which will help us to think about the history of of um the ccp mm, in yeah. a different way yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.